Have you ever encountered a villain who sings his own boss music? Hell, hell. Hell has its laws. Hell, hell. Effect in the cause. Sorry, let me take it down a notch. I just can't get over Raphael's entire character design in Baldur's Gate 3. Yet another shining contribution to Larian Studios' well-deserved Game of the Year award, this fiend is iconic in almost every instance you encounter him. He's introduced to you rather early on in the game, and immediately begins to portray his greatest strength as a character, and it's up to the player to choose how they interact with his cunning personality going forward. I could go on and on about villains like Borderlands 2's Handsome Jack or God of War Ragnarok's Odin, but at the end of the day, they are antagonists to their related storylines, and Raphael, while a prominent force within Baldur's Gate 3, doesn't seem to be in direct conflict with the player's journey at hand, all while exhibiting a force upon the player that doesn't feel like it's matched by many other entities within the game. Welcome to Figuring Out Fantasy, where we'll be taking a look at one of the most entertaining villains to experience in any medium out there, Baldur's Gate 3's charming Raphael. You know those old Disney movies where the villains feel almost uncanny in how much of a performance they give? Well, over the course of this video, you'll find that Raphael gives off a nearly identical feeling to those iconic characters, but spun in a far more devious direction. When we first meet Raphael, we can certainly get a sense of the theatrics we can expect from him in the future, as he wastes no time in spatting out some lines that sound straight out of a Shakespearean play. He also makes a note to claim that he's very much at our service. We don't have much context to understand his motives behind this offering, but are off-put all the same by how forthcoming he sounds. There's even a dialogue option to respond in which the player denies Raphael the opportunity to feel he's shrouding his selfish intentions, but he's then able to casually play it off as if he genuinely means no harm. And if the overly pleasant nature wasn't enough to key you in on how slippery Raphael is, if you take his first offer to remove the illithid from your brain, he will take back his generosity, claiming that you aren't desperate enough making it evident that he isn't in the business of helping people without a catch. Though he doesn't hold up the ruse much longer as he takes you to his house of hopes where he acts a bit more ominous, telling us to enjoy a supper as it may just be our last. And I know the intro to this game is a bit chaotic, but can we take a sec before I start getting teleported to hell while the game is setting the stage with blissful green hills, Raphael? Damn! Even though it seems like he shows his card with a glorious transformation into the devil... Oh. Yeah, um... He's the devil. If the red-tinted skin or the blazing organs in the background didn't give it away, uh, there you are. He immediately goes on to phrase the idea of whether or not he's a friend or a foe in a manner which makes it seem like he doesn't care either way. But he makes one thing clear. He has the power to save you from your situation, which likely means he has the power to do far worse if he wanted to. But regardless of how keen we are to his ultimate intentions, the sheer idea of what just happened makes Raphael already come off as an omnipotent figure who may be looking over our shoulder at any moment in the future. At this point in time, Raphael is not a very relevant force within the game, so it's tough to really see him as a villain so soon, but we're definitely tipped in that direction from our early interactions. Some of the most successful villains you think of could have likely made some sort of impression in the introductory sequences of the game. Think the previously mentioned Handsome Jack, where you just can't get him out of your ear as he commits literal acts of terrorism in the earlier stages of the game. Oh, holy crap! Did you see your head? It was like... <laughs> oh my god! We'll help kill these savages. And even though Handsome Jack stays as a fly in your ear until the end of the game, I would say that both him and Raphael achieve a similar goal in establishing a sense of urgency to get to the bottom of whatever they may have in store. It's honestly one of Baldur's Gate 3's biggest strengths that the world is so large to where there can be a literal devil to exist within the earlier stages of the game and have the feeling that you can simply carry on with your journey as normal. But this is exactly what Raphael wants you to think. Unbeknownst to the player, while roaming the wilderness, one of Raphael's agents, Kirilla Hearthflame, will be monitoring the group. And if captured by the goblin gut, she will save us before we're killed by stabbing the true soul, later revealing that she was sent by Raphael. This immediately makes us second-guess his phrasing of whether or not he's a friend or foe, but certainly affirms that he's a savior as he was saying. Getting this taste of Raphael's heroics in action proves that we don't truly know the bounds of his abilities, or what interest he even has in using them. Any villain who makes you genuinely question whether you should make them an ally or clash with them as opposition feels infinitely more potent as a force on the player than any villain who is simply explained to be as such could ever be. And we later find that it's not just us who is in pursuit of wrapping around his finger, as Act 2 brings us some run-ins with characters who Raphael is either currently in contractual negotiations with, or some whose fate he's already sealed. When we run into Raphael at the Last Light Inn, we can find him playing Lanceboard with Mole if we were able to save her in Act 1. 
and it's a clear example of just what kind of influence the devil has over those who may not be as strong-willed as the player. Once Raphael departs to leave just you and Mole, we can begin to understand how brainwashed victims like this tiefling are from his cunning way with words. While we recognize Raphael's strength in a manner that's layers deep concerning both the risks and potential gains involved, Mole isn't quite as keen, and believes that his power is simply a means to an end involving her goal of getting to Baldur's Gate. When in reality, Raphael is capable of far more, and what he gains from having a thief as good as Mole in his debt for the foreseeable future far outweighs how much effort is involved to go out of his way in helping her. And this is even more evident to why it seems like he's skirting the line on committing to help us. He sees us as valuable to have under contract, but as he phrases in our first meeting, we aren't desperate enough yet. He needs whoever he desires to have binded to one of his hellish contracts to be in their darkest hour, with a void that can only be filled with the power and willingness of the devil. This gives some weight to the phrasing of how the devil you know is more dangerous than the devil you don't, as the devil you know understands how to exploit you as an individual, and will take your greatest weaknesses that they're so intently focused on and use them directly against you to get what they want. He'll even deny Asterian access to the answers he desires related to his mysterious scars, as he understands it's an opportunity to grant somebody a solution to an issue they don't see a possible resolution for themselves allowing him to maneuver his way through the conversation without any real concern for the subject at hand, and all the concern for the possible upper hand he can grant himself. To get a sense of one of his deals in action, we'll have to move a little farther along into the Grand Mausoleum, where Raphael will be waiting outside to warn us of the dangers that lie within. Though as we traverse the depths ahead, we find that this danger that Raphael so emphatically tells us to be wary of is an Orthon, or demon, who is actually a part of one of the Devil's Binding Contracts himself. When encountering your gear, the confrontation can go a multitude of ways. He explains how he owes Raphael a debt as a part of a contract made with him, where he's subjected to living in the depths of the Gauntlet of Shar until he takes care of each and every Dark Justiciar to occupy the area. But laying his head in this gloomy cold mausoleum was the last of his worries, as the contract was a song that would forever echo in your gear's mind until his end was fulfilled. After exploring the possible options afforded to the player, it seems that your gear isn't allowed to make it out of this situation with any advantage whatsoever, as Raphael seems to have played his hands so cleverly that there truly was no real escape. If the player's conversation skills are cunning enough, a series of persuasion rolls can be made to convince your gear that the details of the song he sings requires for his allies and ultimately himself to be killed, resulting in a checkmate for Raphael, a move which your gear actually commends on his way out. But even if we decide to help the Orthon to fulfill his end of the contract by killing the last Dark Justiciar he was so desperately after, it ultimately seems to be a breach of contract, according to Raphael. And we get to see his manipulative way with words yet again. The Devil spins Yurgir's threats and eventually convinces him to take a new deal with some supposed benefits over his current situation. But not without making a note to force him to reward us as the rightful fulfillers of the contract. Yet again, Raphael recognizes us as capable adventurers deserving of praise for a task well completed. Though if Asterion is in your party, you may have struck a deal to take care of your gear in exchange for answers pertaining to the mysterious scars on his back. In which case we find the ability of Raphael to uphold his end of the deal to be impeccable to say the least. He explains head to toe in full detail just what kind of situation Asterion finds himself in, and what possible avenues he may have as a way out of the chaos. This is great and all, but value is in the eyes of the beholder, the hoops in which Raphael had to jump through to fulfill his end of the deal pale in comparison to the dangers he knew we would face in the Gauntlet of Shar. But with what little insight and information we had on our end, it felt like a fun little research session for the Devil was a monumental delivery of knowledge to us. It's still a rather fair exchange of value from a character we wouldn't expect as such from. But as he claims, he will show up to be our savior in our darkest moment, where we can do nothing but accept a bit more devilish contract of his. And in Act 3, he reveals his ultimate goal, which he aims to achieve through holding the dire circumstances at hand against us. The state of events at this point in time is that the world-ending Elder Brain's control is being fought over by the Dead Three, a trio of evil gods consisting of Baal, the Lord of Murder, Bane, the Lord of Darkness, and Merkel, the Lord of Bones. All three of these evil gods are represented by the three antagonists we come across throughout our journey, Kethric Thorm, Orin, and Enver Gortash each of which possess a stone that when united with the other two, become a controlling device for the crown of Karsis, worn by the Elder Brain. Within this mix, there's also two more prominent figures involved. A Mind Flayer we know is the Emperor who is in pursuit of taking over the Elder Brain with us, and a Githyanki Prince who's imprisoned within the Astral Realm for his power to be exploited and prevented from destroying the Absolute altogether. 
As far as Raphael is concerned, he couldn't care less about what happens to this world as it stands before us. His concern are with the Nine Rings of Hell and his longing to reign over them. And this is promptly where we come into the picture. Raphael has been observing. Observing you place all the chess pieces right where he wants them. When we obtain Cethric Thorm's Stone Shard, it thrusts us into a conflict with far greater subsequent threats, without him needing to lift a finger. And with possession of the stone from the Lord of Bones, the other two chosen of Ball and Bane immediately attempt to coerce you into fulfilling their ultimate goals in taking control of the Elder Brain, creating a decision to be made when it comes to how you will ultimately handle the Brain at the end of the day. Will you control it to do your bidding? It seems impossible to free Orpheus, so perhaps siding with the Emperor and using the stones for your interest is the best option to choose. Well, not if Raphael has something to say about it. If you visit the devil in Shoress's Caresses, he will propose what he's been waiting to ask us this entire time. As it stands, there seems to be no straightforward way out, since there's no option available to us in which we can utilize the power of Orpheus for ourselves in an attempt to destroy the brain entirely. So in knowing the dire situation we find ourselves in, Raphael takes a golden opportunity to offer us the one item which would bail us out and give us another option to end things, the Orphic Hammer. This legendary weapon has the power to free the Githyanki Prince from the chains he's bound to, and in turn, allow for the Elder Brain to cease to exist. But he isn't offering it up for free, as we could have guessed from the plethora of interactions we've had with him so far. If we choose to take his assistance, once everything is resolved, Raphael will expect the Crown of Karsis that commanded the Elder Brain in return. <clears throat> huh? You mean that this guy who is already the most manipulative man we could imagine meeting, is going to have access to a device which is capable of puppeteering the f King Elder Brain? Nope. Not happening. But What if... What if we did accept his help? After all, Raphael seems to be the most potent source of power we have seen in this game so far. At least from an allied or neutral force, given all he's been able to influence without much effort. And nearly each and every foe we've run into and negotiated with for some sort of alliance, we can tell that there's some information that they're withholding in pursuit of their own selfish desires. Siding with the Emperor has its fair share of question marks as to what will happen when we finally get him to the position he's been seeking, and choosing either Orin or Gortash have their obvious risks as well, as we're working with not only their motives, but the two other evil gods they represent as well. But with Raphael, he's never proven to us that his interests are to blatantly stab us in the back. Any stature he has within this world is from his reputation within his own domain, Hell. The results of the conflict at hand over Baldur's Gate are simply a show for him to sit back and watch unfold. His priorities are with the Nine Hells as mentioned earlier, so our ultimate goal in stopping the Elder Brain has no real impact on what he's concerned with, other than the fact that it dons the Crown of Karsis. And this crown may carry a bit more history with it than we could have imagined. But before we get into the history lesson, how about you and I strike a deal? You hit that juicy subscribe button, and I provide with glorious analyses of your favorite fantasy worlds. Sounds a lot better than any contract this guy's offered yet. Raphael tells us a brief story of the great archwizard Karsis, who initially forged the crown with aspirations of using its power to rule in the Hells as a god. But such power would be the undoing of a man driven by matching ambition. Karsis' empire and legacy crumbled before him, and he was ultimately killed by the crown in which he conceptualized. And the crown would have been Raphael's if the archdevil Mephistopheles hadn't snatched it up from under him and tucked it away in one of his vaults, never to be used in action again. As Raphael puts it, he made a miracle into a museum piece. We later learn through various clues and even explicit stating from Raphael that Mephistopheles is actually his father, and it is telling to hear the manner in which he speaks of him. But here's where Raphael is infinitely grateful for not just us having come into the picture, but the chosen of the evil gods, since they brought the crown into play in order to take control of the Elder Brain. As an impressive surprise to the devil, the chosen were able to raid Mephistopheles' vault and claim the crown for themselves but he knows how their fate will end when it all comes down to the final moments, and he sees an opportunity to seize his rightful throne in the Hells. With the one weapon to free Orpheus in his possession, Raphael offers to give it to us now in exchange for the crown later, once we ally with Orpheus and slay the Absolute, that is. And it's one tempting offer, as it's the only case scenario in which we're able to free Orpheus and gain the opportunity to destroy the Elder Brain. Regardless of whether or not we ink a deal in this moment, our time with Raphael does not end here. If we travel to a shop named Devil's Fee, we can talk to a dwarf named Helsick, who will grant us passage to a familiar location we hadn't been to since some of our earliest moments in the game, the House of Hope. Another note about this unsuspecting character, she will reveal that she was the one who opened the portal for the Dark Urge and Gortash to steal the crown from the Archdevil's Vault. 
making it seem like this gold dwarf is truly the one getting under Raphael's skin. Regardless, once we travel to the House of Hope, there are two scenarios. The one when you sign the contract with Raphael and are here to find where it lies to break it, and the one where you denied inking a deal with the devil and are instead here to find where the Orphic Hammer lies to claim it for yourself without any stipulations. Though before we head for either of those objectives, while in this House of Hope, we can learn a bit more about the devil. Take a trip into Raphael's bedroom and we can discover… Raphael? Well, not really. This is Harlep. He's an incubus sent by Mephistopheles to satisfy Raphael's desires, presumably in pursuit to distract him from his goals of obtaining the crown. And the way he speaks of Raphael and what sort of vulnerable acts they may engage with feels like it exposes the more human side of the devil. Harlep fulfills Raphael with sexual fantasies, and can take the physical form of anything that's forced to surrender themselves to him. He will try to claim you as the disguise for later use as well, and if you choose to fight back, he's quite the adversary, so gauge your options. It can be extremely beneficial to give in to the Incubus though, as in exchange for use of your physical body, he will give you the key to a safe of Raphael's which lies behind a painting of himself. In the safe, there's a note with a phrase on it, used to unlock the barrier protecting both the contract if you signed it, and the glorious Orphic Hammer if you refuse the deal. Either way, if you steal from the devil, it won't go unnoticed, and he will be waiting for you to try and leave before making one final confrontation with the party. Now the next sequence of events is one of my favorite in gaming I've experienced in quite some time. The buildup of just how theatrical Raphael has been all culminates in this scene and fight. We are absolutely berated for attempting to steal the Orphic Hammer or our contract out from under him, but there's no moment where Raphael feels like he needs to be rid of you as part of his own safety. He even now treats you as insects under his boot who he let run around his yard for too long. And after some narcissistic back and forth with the devil, we are greeted with Raphael's final act. As the fight begins, you already feel the stakes as a bellowing opera voice comes in to set the stage. Followed by layered organs to pronounce the looming evil in the air. We are in hell after all. And with your guard down, Raphael comes in for… his verse? Hell, hell, hell has its laws, hell, hell, effect in the cause, curtain falls, but hold your applause, squirm, squirm, for now down here come the claw. Yes, the greatest display of uncanny villainy I may have ever seen, or, well, heard, is the very being who has attempted to wrap us around his devilish finger this entire time, singing his very own boss music, telling us just how screwed we are. This performance is just layered with iconic chaos. And one of my favorite little plays on words he does, is his interchangeability of the words claws as in the claws of the devil, and claws as in the binding claws of one of his contracts. But while he uses these interchangeably throughout the story, in this moment I don't quite know which feels less intimidating. In surviving the monumental clash in front of us and taking out the devil, we can carry on with the Orphic Hammer and truly choose which ending of the story we wish to see through, though this isn't the only result from one of the many routes the player can take within the game. If we chose not to take a contract from him and didn't steal the Orphic Hammer, he will come in at truly our darkest hour and offer us the contract once more, and this time he isn't here to negotiate. And if we refuse, it's game over, forcing our hand. Even in this conversation alone, we understand Raphael to truly not care about the course of events in this present world, as if you deny him your signature, beyond being annoyed at your stubbornness, he shows little to no emotion about not getting his way as he believes in his omnipotence, showing how irrelevant things are to him if it doesn't contribute towards getting his way. The last we'll see of Raphael in this game is a special post credit scene, and is dependent on your ultimate choices in the story and where the Crown of Carsis ends up. And whether the crown ends up in Gale's hands, Mistra's hands, or Raphael's himself, this speech of his cements every character trait we've come to know and love in one glorious finale. And he leaves what's to come in the future for us to tremble in fear about. As he phrases it, It won't be long before I come knocking at your door. Ta-ta, for now. <laughs>